5.45 p.m., which means it's time for BCTV's weekly media roundup, 5.45 Live. I'm Abby Sherlock. And I'm Roland Boyden. On deck tonight, uh, new updates in the case of last month's double bank robbery. We'll get you some footage from the governor's state of the state, pay-as-you-throw success in Brattleboro, and we'll show you some footage of this week's special public tour of the current police facilities as Brat PD continues to work toward their upgrades. Plus, we've got brand new aerial footage from the I-91 bridge construction project on the way as well. All that and more in just 15 minutes, so stick with us. Welcome back to this January 8th, 2016 edition of 545 Live, our first broadcast of the new year here following BCTV's holiday break. That's a look at some footage of the New Year's Eve fireworks here in Brattleboro, recorded at the base of the West River Trails I-91 bridge outlet by BCTV producer Russ Graybeck. All right, with that, uh, we'll launch into the headlines, and we're going to start with an update to last month's double bank robbery that saw branches of the People's United Bank in both Wilmington and Brattleboro robbed on the same day, initially police believe, by two different suspects. The, the recent arrest of 31-year-old uh, suspect Matthew Martin reveals that authorities believe uh, Martin used a wig and a change of clothes to pose as a woman while robbing the Brattleboro branch. Now, according to the Vermont State Police, Martin claimed to have a bomb and threatened to de detonate it if the tellers didn't comply. The bomb, however, was simply a hoax. Martin is currently being held on $50,000 bail in Springfield and is awaiting his arraignment where he'll face charges including assault and robbery as well as placing a hoax device. All right, next up, with a new year, many thought the Brattleboro Select Board would return to their regular bi-weekly meeting schedule after a brutal two-month run to close out the year in which they met every week. But with much budget work still ahead, the board has scheduled two more meetings, the first for next Tuesday, the 12th of January, and the second for the fourth week, Monday, the 25th. Now, among the elements factoring into this upcoming year's budget is a pending decision to bring trash removal from weekly to bi-weekly as the success of the town's pay-as-you-throw inflammation on local trash production has meant area residents are throwing away much less in an effort to save on bag costs, leading the town to consider the step down to buy weekly pickup, something that could save the general fund as much as $100,000. Because the community responded so well and has moved so much of the waste stream over into recycling and especially into compost, that now the garbage waste stream is much smaller and um, doesn't in include the kinds of wastes that rot and become smelly and health hazards. And so we think there's an opportunity because of that behavioral change to do this and save $100,000 a year. That's a short clip from, from this past week's regular select board meeting. And as we mentioned, there'll be a series of special meetings. We'll cover them all here at Brattleboro uh, TV. And you can find them at brattleborotv.org, where the select board has its own landing page. And of course, they uh, all those meetings show two clicks up the dial on our government and education sister channel, Channel 10. And of course, another topic uh, for much consideration for the Brattleboro Select Board is the ongoing saga of the police fire up Grades, something that after more than a year on the back burner has been moving full steam ahead this fall with a series of new proposals, special meetings, and public outreach forums all on the topic. And with the latest plans looking to move the police fire facilities out of this year 230 Main Street Municipal Center space altogether in favor of the reformer-occupied Black Mountain Road space, members of Brat PD took the time this week to host a public tour of the current police facilities here in an effort to help illuminate some of the building's many deficiencies when it comes to offering safe and effective policing services. And who other than uh, hardworking BCTV volunteer James Bansleben was there to gather some footage of the tour. This building um, was, a, uh, it was, a was a high school and it was a courthouse as well at some point. Okay. Um, there was like a municipal court, like a Brattleboro court. Also present at the tour was Commons reporter Olga Peters. We'll have a full article uh, on it in this coming week's edition of the Commons, something we'll return to in greater depth on our own Commons news report here on 545 Live next week. 
Next, we head north to Montpelier, where this week the governor presented what looks to be his last State of the State address. And while familiar topics like the state's suffocating opiate problem, renewable energy, and others made the roster, the headliner from two years back, single-payer health care, received not a single mention. Our innovation over the past two years is getting results. 65% more Vermonters are getting treatment. We're moving addicts into recovery instead of jail. Speaking of the governor's state of the state, addiction isn't just the hot topic here in the Green Mountain State. Across the river, presidential candidates took up the call during stumping in the Granite State. For more on this, we turn now to the students of Landmark College's 2016 J-Term Broadcast Journalism class. Addiction is the new hot topic in New Hampshire campaigning. Presidential candidates are speaking about their connections to addiction in a state that has been hard hit by opiate epidemics. Jeb Bush's daughter suffered from addiction, and Trump's brother struggled and eventually succumbed to alcoholism. Martin O'Malley spoke about a friend who lost their daughter to addiction, and Carly Fiorina buried her daughter due to addiction. Every candidate promised to tackle the problem in a state that looks to these politicians for more answers. That's a short clip from the first episode uh, of the Landmark Broadcasters J-Term class as they'll do four different news shows during their three-week winter intensive. Now you can find all the shows from Landmark Broadcasters as they do news uh, stories and things like that. Find uh, the Landmark Broadcasters series page all at brattleborotv.org. All right, we've got the calendar just around the corner, but first we did promise some new drone footage from BCTV as we uh, got a chance, uh, permission to fly it around the uh, I-91 bridge construction project as, as they continue uh, to work looking to complete uh, what will be, uh, once it's finished, the widest single-span bridge on the East Coast. All right, with that, it's time to launch into our BCTV video calendar, which is all sponsored by the Brattleboro Savings and Loan, whose generous contributions to BCTV each year will help fund our weekly look at upcoming events. And we'll start by talking about Gallery Walk. Technically, we are on the second Friday of the month, but with last Friday being New Year's Day, Gallery Walk was bumped back to today, and that means lots of happenings downtown, out on Putney Road, along the Western Ave Corridor, and West Brattleboro, and more. And Gallery Walk does have its own website, gallerywalk.org, where you can find the official flyer, links to websites for featured galleries, and much more. All right, we'll move on in the calendar now. Tonight marks the return of Rock Voices, the highly anticipated choir and band performance, this year directed by Tony Lechner, with all the proceeds benefiting the AIDS Project of Southern Vermont. Now that's set to kick off in just over an hour at 7 p.m. at the Center Congregational Church on Main Street in Brattleboro, and BCTV producer James Banslaven will be there this year to record it for BCTV. Plus, we've got a calendar spotlight video flashback now to last year's Rock Voices concert recorded by BCTV producer Russ Gray. And we'll wrap up the calendar here with a winter parking ban reminder as we look at some footage from 545 cor Live correspondent James Bansleben of the storm that dusted the region with snow just a few days too late to provide a white Christmas. And while no records were snowfall were set, it has taken the town's Department of Public Works some extra nights of snow clearing to get sidewalks and parking areas tidied up, something that's prompted the DPW to continue to remind residents of the winter parking ban as parking on streets between midnight and 7 a.m. will result in towing from now all the way through April 15th, with snow removal commencing at 10.30 p.m. on nights following a storm when the amber strobe lights at all major parking lots is flashing. Overnight, parking inside the Transportation Center parking garage, however, remains open through the winter. All right, now before we say adieu to this edition of 545 Live, let's take a quick look at the weather, courtesy of the High School's Morning News Advisory Broadcast crew, BUHS-TV. Take it away, guys. What's this weekend's weather look like? On Saturday, we have a high of 32 and a low of 32, which is interesting. Um, and an uh, angry cloud, because probably cloudy. Um, Sunday is going to be a rainy day with a 47 high and a 27 low. And on Monday, we have a partly sunny day with a high of 33 and a low of 15. Now back to the desk. 
That does it for another edition of 545 Live. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week right here on BCTV, Comcast Channel, Cable Channel 8 at 5.45 p.m. Eastern Time. In the meantime, thanks for watching. Thank you.